So then, there has been quite a bit of news, and mostly it's at the expense of the biggest companies in the world and their half-baked attempts to make video games. So, let's get into it. To start today's proceedings, the least surprising news of all time. Google have let go of their in-house Stadia development teams. The service itself is going nowhere, for now at least, but their unique selling point is dead in the water. The only thing that Stadia could have done that would have been super cool is things that could only be done on Stadia, because there were some technological advancements there. But with no in-house developers making stuff for Stadia, that ain't gonna happen. So, the first question, what does this mean for the future of Stadia? Honestly, I mean, it's obvious, it's what everybody except Google have been saying since the service launched. It's a niche product for a niche set of users, and I think it's just going to ble bleed slowly until Google pulls the plug on it. This is the first step towards that, because it's obvious that Google want less skin in the game, and that tells you a lot. Now, if we read a little bit into the statement that Google released, it's more of the usual what you'd expect from a big tech company. They say the technology of Stadia has been proven and that it does work at scale, which in fairness is true enough. They say the future of the industry is games on any screen and that that has been their vision since the beginning. And in fairness, track forward 40 or 50 years, maybe even 10 years, yeah, a lot more of that will happen. So they do say that as such, they'll continue to invest in Stadia in 2021 and beyond. But obviously, they just don't want to invest that much. That's why they axed that many jobs. It's like over 150 development positions. Now, the reason why they're winding down their dev teams reads like this. Making AAA games is too expensive and it takes too long. Uh, and let's be honest, like, yeah, obviously. It's pretty hard to do. What the hell were they thinking if they, like, didn't see this coming? Are they suddenly surprised that video games are actually risky, long-term investments? I mean, based on timeframes, it's likely that Google execs just saw money flying out the window and not a whole lot coming in, uh, at least for the next few years, and maybe they got cold feet. Because look at the dates. They only started their first studio in March 2019. Their second in March 2020 and AAA games are, at the very least, three-year projects, especially when it's new IP. And you've got to add in time for the teams to be built, to get acquainted, to get up to speed, to let the engineers grapple with Stadia, to actually do the pre-production for the game projects. You're looking at four, maybe five years to make a game there, and it hasn't, been even, it hasn't even been two years, and Google are already calling it quits. And that's in spite of them having pretty incredible talent, it would seem. I mean, you've got Jade Raymond of Ubisoft and EA. You've got Sony Santa Monica's Shannon um, Studstill as leads. I mean, she shipped God of War. I mean, these are people who I think would have been able to put together incredible teams. And clearly, it's all went for nothing. I don't know, maybe Jade will be allowed to finish her project eventually because she's had a tumultuous career and her last actual release was Watch Dogs. And Watch Dogs was almost seven years ago, just in case you want to feel a bit old. It's okay though. They say they've got a plan to get some of that investment back. That Stadia won't be a platform for gamers, but it will be for publishers. They're going to offer, basically, right, Stadia's tech to game publishers and platforms while also continuing to run the service. Now, that might have been a good move back in 2019, but now in 2021, they're pretty late to the party. Everyone's already got clout. Xbox has xCloud. Sony has PS Now and Remote Play. Nintendo, we've seen partner up with cloud gaming already with other partners. PC gamers, I mean, man, we've got GeForce Now, Shadow, Steam Remote Play, Parsec. We have great options. These platforms could probably benefit from using parts of Stadia's tech. Absolutely. But... I mean, almost nobody in the games industry, I think, is going to want a full white label solution here when so many of them are already making their own. Now, there is value in their work, yes, but I just don't think that the Stadia overall product's really going to come together. Really, I do think they've got these engineers that have built something pretty incredible. It's just, it's Google. They're good at engineering and stuff, and they're pretty rubbish at product. Now, for what it's worth, in a way, you could say this was almost always doomed to fail. Gaikai, if you remember that, that was ground zero for cloud gaming all the way back in 2008. And 
Phil Harrison, the Stadia lead, was on Gaikai's board of directors. So if you've been in cloud gaming for years and you still refuse to acknowledge the realities of it, I don't know what to tell you, dude. I mean, a simple look at internet services in the USA, that's going to tell you that, sure, it's great for the city, but it's going to be a niche enough product at best. Or, like the other cloud gaming services out there, a supplementary service, right? Buying a game on Xbox is more attractive if you're somebody who travels about because you'll get your game locally and you'll also get to do it on xCloud as a bonus. And versus that, there is, I would say, zero compelling reason to buy a game on Stadia. Pretty rubbish. Exclusivity was perhaps their only real selling point if they could have made some really cool projects, but that's dead in the water now. So until they eventually get dumped into the Google graveyard, they are just going to continue as they are. A barely used platform offering third-party games at full price. They're even being a thorn in our side in the way out because the Yakuza spin-off Judgment's next-gen version is hitting consoles in April. But because of the Stadia exclusivity deal, it won't be on PC. Thanks, Google. Now, while we're talking about massive tech companies getting into games and messing it up royally, there is, of course, somebody else who comes into mind. But first, there's Patreon, because it's February, it's a new month, and that means a new opportunity to get all of this cool stuff that our uh, game studio art team has put together. And of course, the daily briefing drops straight into your inbox. This month's pin is, uh, is the shield. Goes pretty damn great with last month's sword, which we are packing up now to send to everybody. So. There's that. We're working on bigger and cooler videos behind the scenes. This year, you'll see, I believe, the next Fortnite, the first big one. It's going to be pretty awesome, and your support is vital to it. So, thank you, and let's go. Did you guess the company I was referencing? It's Amazon. What a surprise. Amazon and Google both thought they could use their prowess and cash to walk into the games industry, but they both found something out. Making games is hard. Well, last week, Bloomberg posted an expose on the workings of Amazon Game Studios. So when the studio was spun up eight years ago, it was headed up by this guy called Mike Frizzini. He had never made a game before, so that's off to a bad start, and the situation was apparently all so toxic and bad uh, for Amazon's game plans that his employees ended up calling him cancer. So that's, uh, that's not a great review. After spending billions... Yes, it's literally billions of Amazon's money on hiring top-tier talent. He then proceeded to largely ignore what they told him, their advice. He wanted nothing but billion-dollar franchises, and he was the one who mandated that they build and use Lumberyard, a major CryEngine fork, instead of just using an off-the-shelf engine solution like Unity or Unreal. Now, the article goes on and on. If you're interested in Amazon's many failings in corporate culture, do give it a read, but we're just gonna highlight some fun bits for you here. There's one big takeaway, right? Companies that are entirely driven by data and tight corporate culture are fundamentally not that well suited to making games because uh, the parts that make games creative, fun, and you know, all about a user experience, just seems they play second fiddle in the meeting rooms. That's really the vibe you get from it. Now, they put somebody with no experience in games uh, at the head of the studio. They then spent years chasing trends. We now know, right, that the unreleased Crucible game was an attempt to ape Overwatch. You know, just four years late. But before that, they had a MOBA called Nova. They had a Fortnite clone called Intensity. Neither of those saw the light of day. They paid to license Crytek's engine, they developed it into the reportedly a bit nightmarish Lumberyard, and then they mandated using that instead of Unreal or Unity. And if you're getting echoes of Frostbite, Engine, Era, EA, you're not the only one. I mean, look what happened as soon as EA allowed Respawn to use the engine of their choice for their projects. Bam! We get Fallen Order. Made reportedly in pretty quick time too. They also, Amazon that is, had unrealistic expectations from, uh, for their projects, from the top, basically assuming that all they needed was ambition and money to rule the gaming world. There was two projects that were apparently called Bezos Games, and this is because he was so just willing to put as much money and time as possible into them to essentially show off Amazon's might and then to pull people into Prime. Now, they have all the right ambition and attitudes, I think, to make products and services, but I think not games. I mean, big tech keep on proving they're not that good at making games. 
least Amazon have some hope here. They just need to maybe learn from their creative and successful Prime Video successes and apparently get rid of uh, Mike Frazzini because he doesn't seem that good. Now, as it stands, get ready for this. Amazon pumps about half a billion a year into their studio, and they've got nothing to show for it except for two games that were so bad they were unreleased. The next opportunity, of course, is New World. And there's a bit more hope there. It's due out this spring after an almost year-long delay. I will say that worryingly, it has been very quiet on that front since their beta back in August. And that's meant that, well, the beta had people feeling cautiously optimistic, like it could be improved and really fixed up a lot and it did have some cool unique elements, but the radio silence is a bit odd. It does have promise as a game, but basically it needed to work on uh, combat and content before release. So hopefully Amazon can make the uh, changes necessary to avoid throwing more billions of dollars and talented developers into the bin. And hopefully by the time it comes to them making a Lord of the Rings MMO to go with their Lord of the Rings TV show, they've got their act together because if they cock up Lord of the Rings, well, I mean, it'll piss me off a lot. I don't know about you. Okay, time for a new segment. We're going to call it The Rumor Mill, and uh, here's the intro that Matt wrote for it. I hope you like some cheese. Let's grind some rumors down and try to bake some sense into them. <sighs> that was very cheesy, Matt. Good job. Okay, let's get in. First, Microsoft acquisitions. They have been more, uh, more open about their ambition for acquisitions, right? And as such, the usual uh, spots have been aflame with rumors about who these acquisitions might be and when. There are two that stand out right now. First, and the most likely, is them purchasing Techland, the Polish developers of Dead Island and Dying Light. That might sound a bit out of left field, but listen up. Dying Light 2 basically vanished from the release schedule at the start of 2020, and it's not really been heard of since. It's a bit odd. Now, it's a big AAA open-world survival game, and unless Techland have restarted the entire project, it's bound to be due out soon enough. Now, this comes from a well-sourced rumor that Microsoft are soon going to pick up a studio releasing a game in 2021 and turn it into an exclusive. So if you put the things together, you can see why people think the Dying Light 2 fits the bill. Now, the other one is the, uh, well, the returning rumor that Microsoft want to pick up Sega. Now, without going too deeply into it, this is a dance that's been done regularly, even just last year. But to support it, Sega and Microsoft have been working very closely recently, right? Like um, Yakuza, right? That's been a surprise hit on uh, Game Pass and PC, and at the same time, Sega recorded, so, uh, recorded some really, really big one-off payments release uh, related to their game titles and IP last year. So, as wild as it sounds, Xbox could finally be trying to make up for their ever-failing Japan approach. It's no secret that Sony have got a bit complacent, a bit negligent with the Japanese market. They're more interested in Western AAA. So, a value play from Microsoft that includes PC gaming and a Japanese favorite acquisition, that could kill a bunch of birds with one stone. And the other thing here that's quite big is that Sega Sammy just restructured and they did it so that they split their video game and pachinko business into two fully formed subsidiary companies. That would mean that if Microsoft would want to purchase Sega and just get the video games, well, that would be a hell of a lot easier. So, food for thought. Then the next big rumor is Star Wars. We've heard about a Knights of the Old Republic game that's, uh, well, not being done at EA, but at some other studio. And what's interesting is that uh, some sleuthing by Reddit has turned up that it's probably going to be a studio called um, Asper Media. They're a porting and remaster focused group, uh, recently involving, of course, the, um, the Jedi Knight re-releases. And there's quite a lot pointing towards this. Um, there's you know, rumors of old KOTOR re-releases. That would be the perfect stage to bring back you know, a, a new one, bring stuff into the modern Star Wars canon. This studio even ported the originals to Mac OS, iOS, and Android. So they do have some KOTOR experience. I mean, from my personal feeling, a full video game might be asking a lot from them, but if they have Lucasfilm games helping them out, maybe they'll be capable, and it would explain why Jason Schreier teased us by saying that we'll never guess who's making it. So there you go. 
And because we're talking rumors, it's time for the obligatory Elden Ring watch. The latest bit of news is that Jeff Grubb hinted that Nibble's unhealthy excitement should soon go to the moon. Now, Jeff's been at this sort of baseless speculation for the past eight months with zero to show for it, so maybe they're just having a laugh. Or maybe we'll find out what the hell's going on with Elden Ring. I don't know. But what I do know is that's it for the news. If you want to support the team making this content and the big chunky releases that we'll be, uh, we'll be doing, the sort of deeper features that we're trying to work on, you can check out the Patreon, where of course you also get some pretty damn sweet loot. Okay, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.